global issue, and we have a special guest joining us this evening, Francesca Unsworth. She is the director of news and current affairs at BBC, visiting Seoul this week to attend the 2018 Public Broadcasters International Conference hosted by KBS, and has graciously agreed to come here in the studio and uh, tell us talk about this issue a little bit. Uh, Ma'am, thank you very much for joining us despite your busy schedule. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here in Seoul. And I understand you uh, came this morning, so uh, perhaps uh, it is a physically tiring day, but also in terms of uh, news coverage and um, being in charge of what people would arguably say is one of, if not the most uh, uh, important news organizations in the world. Fake news must be an issue that is, if not at the very top, uh, one of the items on your agenda. Very much so. And um, I, I think it's it's very near the top of the, everybody's agenda, or should be, because it really is a hugely signif- significant phenomena that the world is facing at the moment, because audiences and pu- publics all over the world are finding it increasingly difficult to trust the information that they are receiving. And if you don't trust the information that you are receiving, you can't really live your life properly. You can't make decisions properly. If you can't sort out what is fact from fiction, it's a really significant issue. And we have to try and address this problem. It feels like... The the premise is also very difficult because the definition of fake news sort of depends on the prism, I suppose, you're looking it through. It, it has become a very ideological, almost a very tribal thing, and, and you're getting cross accusations uh, from left and right uh, about what exactly fake news is. How would you define fake news? Well, I, 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 in a way, I think the term should be banned, to be honest, <laughs> fake news, because I think that what we're talking about here is disinformation. Because so many people, as you indicate, are using this term in loose ways. Mm -hmm. So fake news can be a number of things. Fake news can be people sitting in a, um, you know, room in Macedonia or something as they were a few years ago, making up stories for commercial gain. Or it can be government-sponsored hackers trying to interfere in the electoral processes of other countries, which we know that the Russians did and are doing. Or it can be, um, which I don't think it is, but politicians tend to use this term when they they simply don't agree with somebody. Mm -hmm. So we hear them say, oh, that's fake news, when they actually just think that that's an opinion they don't accept. Or it can also be used to mean something's overspun, isn't quite right. 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 And there's a difference between an honest mistake and something which has been genuinely made up. So I really think that we should be clear about our terminology here and talk about disinformation, things which are put out there as fact, which are not fact. Is there then a worry that as you uh, rightly point out with perhaps the idea that the terminology is problematic, uh, saying something is fake news. You mentioned uh, politicians who have uh, exploited this. I I guess most people can think of one very prominent politician in the United States that has sort of taken it upon himself to uh, decry things that he does not like as fake news, esteemed organizations like the New York Times or the Washington Post. Is there a worry that because of this sort of uh, rhetoric that has been uh, going about with fake news, that there is now this this widespread erosion of trust in what people can say mainstream media, but uh, uh, sources of information that we have trusted over the decades, like the BBC. It's not just Donald Trump that uses this term. I have heard UK politicians Mm. use this term too. And I think they need to be extremely careful because what that contributes to is an erosion of trust on the part of, of their own electorates all over the world, which they will not benefit from. Right. They will be the victims of that too. Because if people can't trust us, the media, then they're not going to trust the politicians either. So politicians need to be really careful when they bandy this term around. And it is a real issue for us as established broadcasters because we have to get out there and say, look, we have standards. We fact check our our information. We have editorial policies and guidelines which we adhere to. 
And by and large, we can be trusted. It doesn't mean we don't make mistakes right. because we're only human. We do make mistakes, but they're mistakes which are honestly made. And that's an important distinction. Uh, doing a little bit of research uh, ahead of this interview, I understand that the BBC, um, there are some very creative things that your organization is doing. Uh, one that uh, popped out to me was uh, utilizing the BBC iPlayer app, uh, going into the classrooms, um, uh, having teachers uh, show kids, and gamification, where you have this very fun game uh, about deadlines and how to file a story and what you have to do to use uh, proper judgment as a journalist. And, and that seems like a great way at the grassroots uh, from, from a young age to help children, uh, young people understand what ex actually is real news versus fake news. But here in Korea, and I, I imagine it's the same in the UK and it is in the US as well, the targets do seem to be, to a large extent, uh, uh, sometimes members of the elderly, maybe not as sophisticated with technology and how to utilize social media. A and when they're inundated with all of these stories, is it too late then to try to sort of... Um, kind of cut through that fog, at least for the uh, perhaps more elderly among us? Well, I don't think it's ever too late. And certainly one of the things that we've been trying to do, as you say, at the BBC, is improve the standards of media mm -hmm. literacy amongst everybody. And we have particularly targeted school children and young people because, of course, most of this disinformation is prevalent on social media platforms, which tend to be used less, maybe it's different in Korea, but used less, slightly less so by the elderly in the UK. Right. So it's young people who I think are more susceptible to it as they're on social media and this stuff is popping up all the time. So our aim at the BBC has been to help school children and young people establish, look at this information and try to establish and give them ways of finding out whether this is true or not. And that's what we have tried to do. We also have this thing called fact check. So we take stories which are circulating and we look at whether they're true or not. And we did one recently with this thing about <clears throat> which came from Russia, about man-spreading on the metro. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you heard of this story. Yes. And our BBC trending team, which looks at what's circulating on social media, analysed this story and s I think established really that this was actually not quite as it seemed, mm. that there might have been some disinformation about this and the person who was circulating the story had a political agenda in so doing, and it wasn't quite as it seemed. And that's the sort of thing that we're putting effort into doing. The South Korean government has uh, publicly stated that fake news is a problem, and they're looking at ways to try and... Uh uh, I guess, mitigate the negative effects of fake news uh, immediately. And I suppose a natural reaction to that were concerns about whether this uh, violates uh, uh, certain principles like freedom of speech and and ex expression. Uh, in, in terms of uh, with the BBC, and I know it plays a unique role in both British society and in terms of how the global community consumes news, um, is there a fine line between what the government can do to try to combat fake news uh, before it turns into sort of this overarching debate then about uh, are we free to express ourselves in any way we want to? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, I am a, a huge believer in freedom of expression and I'm a big believer in how everybody should be allowed to express an opinion. You have to give due weight to those opinions. There's no point in, um, in you know, put, saying that giving t too much value to people who are putting out factually incorrect things on the basis of opinion. We don't particularly want that. That mm. should go, t that should be challenged. But I do think that we have to understand the difference between what is fact and what is opinion and make it quite clear to audiences that there is a difference here. Everybody's entitled to a view, but the views of people based on knowledge and fact are of more value than those which are not based on fact and knowledge. And, and I think that's an important thing to state. As the News and Current Affairs Director of BBC, and again, uh, 
some could argue to say one of the more uh, important uh, positions uh, in terms of uh, leading sort of the the next wave of how journalism moves forward uh, in the civilized world. Uh, you know, I've, I've read anecdotes where uh, if uh, the BBC is um, uh, fairly stern in its questioning to uh, Boris Johnson, the foreign affairs minister, that uh, you may get a call from uh, Theresa May uh, saying that uh, <laughs> you were being unfair to him. I, I'm just wondering, is, is this a sort of unique phenomenon with this current uh, political climate that, that we're in, this emergence of sort of right-wing populism in Europe and the United States and in various other pockets of the world. And if that climate changes, we can um, see a, a better climate for us as journalists? Or do you think this is the new normal and that this is something that the BBC and other media organizations like uh, KBS just have to deal with going forward? Well, I think that it is the new normal in a sense that I do think that we are living in a more polarized world at the moment than we have been in the past. And I think it comes out of all sorts of things. I think it comes out in Western democracies of the crash of 2008 and people not seeing their living standards go up and being somewhat questioning of Mm. the capitalist model. I think there's all sorts of things that you could ask about why that might be the case. But I also think that this is a great opportunity for public service broadcasters. We take money off everybody. We have to serve everybody. We have duties. We have responsibilities. And I think that we need to be clear about articulating that to the public and actually saying, look, because of that, we can be trusted. Mm. And I think that we sh- we need to capitalise on that and, and, and really get out there and sell ourselves to our audiences and in that way build trust in, in, in us and say that, you know, we, we do have standards, we check things and we can be trusted. I want to thank you once again for taking the time out of your uh, very busy schedule and joining us here on Korea 24. Fran Unsworth, thank you and best of luck to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here.